Hello class, welcome to the STAT 312 Chapter 7 Part 1 video on Simple Linear Regression 1. To begin, let's start with a review of what is regression. So in our descriptive statistics for simple linear regression, we say that regression concerns quantifying relationships between variables, i.e. predicting some response y on the basis of one or more predictors or explanatory variables x1, x2, all the way to xm. If we take in consideration to regression in the terms of chapter 7 versus our previous chapter 6 discussions, in ANOVA we had a continuous response variable and a nominal predictor variable. In regression, both our X and Y variables are continuous. So for example, we could use a very popular data set called the real estate example, which concerns itself with the 1986 real estate appraisal article, where we let Y be the selling price of our home in $1,000, which again, Y is our response variable, and we can let our predictor variable X be home size per 100 feet squared. Notice that we do have a condition variable, but we will examine this in chapter five, for, excuse me, chapter eight. In chapter seven, we will focus on selling price and size. You will see the reference to this example quite a bit throughout chapters 7 and 8. The simplest possible version of a regression problem is when there is a single x to predict and explain y and the relationship between x and y is approximately a line. That is what we are going to focus on in chapter 7. 1x to 1y and the relationship between is approximately a line. We call this the simple linear regression, and our author treats simple linear regression both descriptively and inferentially. For us, we are going to concern ourselves with two basic descriptive questions. The first, what is the best line to use in describing how y varies with x? And second, how may one quantify the strength of any apparent linear relationship between x and y? These two questions are going to be the focus of this lecture video. We'll begin with the first question. So to begin, let us examine these two scatter plots and let us try to make a line that will best represent the data. So in doing so, I'm going to make a line for our first scatter plot and our second scatter plot. Now in doing so, I wanted my line to go follow the general trend of the data and in some ways try to hit as many data points as possible. This is generally the philosophy of middle school mathematics when they tell you to draw a line of best fit. But let's talk about how we can do this mathematically. So our traditionally answer to how do we choose a best fitting line to describe an XY data set is to apply a principle of least squares. This involves looking for a line that makes as small as possible the sum of squared vertical distances from plotted XY points to the line. Pictorially, this means that one jiggles the line on the plot below until one has made the sum of shaded areas as small as possible. So to explain this a little more clearly, let us assume these black points that I'm kind of filling in to be blue at this point are our scatter plots. Now, if you notice, there is a distance between each scatter point and our black line of best fit. We want this distance to be as small as possible. So this idea of least squares is we take this distance and we turn it into a box and which boxes we can make area, and the idea is to make these areas as small as possible. Our formula for our line is y equals beta naught plus beta one x. Now, just to make a little aside at this point, you may say that formula is a bit different than what you're used to. That is not quite true. 
in your high school and middle school mathematics, you learned to draw a line in the formula of y equals mx plus b, where m is your slope and b is your y-intercept. That is still true in statistics. We have just rearranged your formula to be y equals b plus mx, where b is equal to beta naught and m is equal to beta 1. The formula itself is still the same. So the idea of making our line of best fit is we are still having an equation of the line, beta naught is our y-intercept, and beta 1 is our slope. To our best fitted line is going to minimize the distance between the scatter plot points and our drawn line. That's where the idea of jiggling to find our minimum distances. To say this more formally and algebraically, the problem of fitting a line is to choose a slope beta 1 and an intercept beta naught that make as small as possible the quantity of the summation of the quantity y minus the quantity beta naught plus beta 1 x and quantity n quantity squared. So again, y those are our actual points, our scatter points. And this beta naught plus beta one x, this is our theoretical, or this is our line. Now, technically speaking, our beta naught and beta one are a nice calculus problem, but thankfully they simplify to a pretty simple solution. So our best slope is going to be beta one hat, the hat shows that it's a theoretical, equals the summation of the quantity x minus x bar multiplied by y minus y bar all over the summation of the quantity x minus x bar squared. Notice if we were to simplify this, it would be the summation of x minus x bar multiplied by y minus y bar. So again, this is each individual x value minus the average of our x values and each individual y value minus the average of our y values multiplied by the summation of x minus x bar multiplied by the summation of x minus x bar. We could simplify this so that what we really have is the summation of y minus y bar over the summation of x minus x bar. So really what we have is what we are traditionally referring to as the slope as the change in y over the change in x. So again, I want to emphasize this and you'll hear this multiple times. This concept of least squares line is not new to you. I'm just preventing, I'm presenting it at a higher level and a lot of the terms we use are synonyms to simpler terms you learned in your previous studies. So just to sum up what we were talking about before, in order to find our best least squares line, we wanna minimize the distance between our actual data points and our theoretical line. To find our slope, it is still the change in y over change of x. To find our intercept, we calculate the average of our y values minus our slope multiplied by the average of our x values. This will equal beta naught hat, which again, we represent as our theoretical slope. And we call this the least squares slope and intercept. Using our real estate example, we can be given using jumps, analyze fit y by x to find that beta 1 hat equals 1.9 per $1,000 over 100 feet squared and our beta naught hat equals 16.01 and then again, that's per $1,000. And so that would mean that our least squares line is y equals 16.01 plus 1.900x, where y is the selling price and x is the size of the home. 
Again, we write it in statistics with the y-intercept first, followed by our slope. Now, in order to give this a more practical understanding, we can judge that in 1986, the price of homes in the area under consideration increased at a rate about $19 per feet squared. How, and that's just a way of interpreting our slope. And we can find that out by our calculated slope of 1.900, and we multiply it by the units of our slope, which would be $1,000 per 100 feet squared, which equals $19 per feet squared. And just so you have an understanding of what that analyzed fit y by x screen would give you, it gives you this output here. So under linear fit, it has your equation, and then it gives you a summary of fit where we have r squared, r squared adjusted, root mean squared error, mean of response, which again, that would be your Y bar and observation or some weights, our number of observations, which in this case is 10. Some of these, as in the last two, have meaning to you at this point. Um, R squared, R squared adjusted, and root mean squared error don't mean much to you yet, but we will go through what each of those means throughout this course. At this point, since we have talked a little bit of how to construct the least squares line, I'd like to do that now using the small fake data set, where we have x being negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, and y being 4, 3, 3, 1, and negative 1. So I have set up this chart to kind of make things a little bit easier in calculating our line. So to begin, we'll, we're going to need to know what is the average of our x and y values. So we know that we have a sample size of five. Our x values, if we were to add up, this is going to equal zero over five, which will equal zero. That'll be nice to subtract. And the average of our y, four plus three plus three plus one plus negative one, that's going to be 10 over five, which will equal two. So very good, this should not be too bad. So we're gonna start with this first and second column. So to begin, negative two minus zero, that would be negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. And now we are gonna subtract two from each of our y values. And this would become two, one, one, negative one, and negative three. At this point, I do want to take a quick pause. If we were to add up the totals of these two rows, notice that they are equivalent to zero. This is a good check for you to make sure you're solving these problems correctly. If these values are not zero or extremely close to zero, that means there was some sort of mistake made on our part. Now we can begin with our third column which is x minus x bar squared. So basically it's our first column squared. This will be four, one, zero, one, four. And again, we're gonna need to take the sum of this row and that's going to be equal to 10. We're gonna need this value when we calculate our slope and y-intercepts. Next, we're going to square our second column, and this will be 4, 1, 1, 1, and 9. Again, we're going to need to take a sum of our row, so 4 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus, 1 plus 9, and that will equal 16. And then last but not least, we're going to multiply our first and second row together for our final row, so this will be negative 4, negative 1, 0, negative 1, and negative 6. We will add this all together and we will get negative 12. Okay, so each of these last three rows are necessary in order to calculate our slope, y-intercept, and additional values that we're going to talk about later. So I don't have to keep referring to these as rows three, four, and five. I'm going to give these names and I'm going to call this row where we're multiplying x minus x bar squared. I'm going to identify this as SSXX. 
and our quantity of y minus y bar squared, I'm going to call this SSYY. And our SSXY will be our last column. Now at this point, we have all the information we need in order to calculate our slope and y-intercept. So first to calculate our slope, our beta 1 hat, if you recall, it was the summation of the quantity x minus x bar multiplied y minus y bar. So really what it is, it's this SSXY over the summation of x minus x bar squared, or in other words, SSXX. So this would be negative 12 over 10, which would equal negative 1.2. In order to find our y-intercept, it would be beta naught hat, and just to review the formula, it is y bar minus beta 1 hat multiplied by x bar. So this would be 2 minus negative 1.2 multiplied by 0, so this will equal 2. Therefore, our line of best fit, or our least squares line, is going to be y equals 2 minus 1.2x. And I'm going to put a box around that just to make it a little bit easier to identify. So there we have it. There's our way of calculating our line of best fit. But that doesn't actually answer our first descriptive question. Or excuse me, I apologize. That does answer our first question. So I'm going to at this point scroll back to slide 84 and write down the answer to our question. That is, what is the best line to use in describing how y varies with x? The answer is the least squares line. So at this point, we've now come to a conclusion of our first question. We have an answer. Now we're going to focus for the rest of these slides on our second question. And that is, how may one quantify the strength of any apparent linear relationship between x and y? And to begin, we're going to travel to slide 91. And so to measure the strength of the linear association, as an initial measure of association between two variables, x and y, we'll discuss the so-called sample correlation, also known as the sample linear correlation, or what you may have heard to it referred to before is the correlation coefficient, and is equal to r equal to the summation of x minus x bar and quantity multiplied by the quantity of y minus y bar, all over the square root of the summation of x minus x bar and quantity squared multiplied by the summation of the quantity y minus y bar and quantity squared. Using the terms I've identified before as SSXY over the square root of SSXX multiplied by SSYY. In our real estate example, our correlation coefficient is going to be equal to point 9397, or excuse me, 0.9379, which we could find by going to jumps, analyze, multi, multi. But the issue with knowing this value is we don't know what it means. And in statistics, as I've emphasized before, being able to calculate a value is one thing, knowing it's an interpretation is another, and in statistics, you need to know both. So here's some nice facts about the correlation coefficient. So first off, its values stem between negative 1 and 1. If it is exactly positive 1, that means your xy points all fall in a string, single straight line with a positive slope. The reverse is true when you have r equal to negative 1. That means we have your xy points falling in a single straight line with a perfect negative slope. In this regard, uh, we compare the formulas for beta 1 hat and r. They're very much alike, and note that they must have the exact same sign. So again, the sign for slope and the sign for the correlation coefficient have to be the same. If 
your R is close to positive or negative one, that would indicate we have a strong linear relationship. And when R is near zero, that would indicate a lack of linear relationship. Again, remember the correlation coefficient only determines a linear relationship or rather a linear association. So for example, our real estate info, R equals 0.94. So this would indicate a fairly strong positive linear relationship between size and price. And logically that makes sense. A larger house is going to cost more. Now, if we also consider our small, our small fake data set, we could go and calculate our correlation coefficient. Remember the formula is SX, xy over the square root of ssxx multiplied by ssyy using the information found on slide 90. This would be negative 12 over the square root of 10 multiplied by 16 and this would equal negative 0.9487. And so once again, we do have a pretty um, large R value as in it is close to negative one or one, in this case, close to negative one. So this would indicate that we have a strong negative linear relationship between our X and Y values. Now, fortunately for us, this isn't the only possible way to measure a correlation or relationship that exists between our predictors and our response. A second measure of strength of linear association between X and Y is something called the coefficient of determination. It is abbreviated as capital R squared. And this is built on two measures of variability in Y's called sum of squares, which we've talked about before. So the first is that total sum of squares also known as TSS. If this seems familiar to you, it absolutely should. We have talked about it before. Now, what is TSS? It is the summation of the quantity of Y minus Y bar and quantity squared, which is equivalent to a value we just calculated a few minutes ago, the SSYY. And another way to calculate it would be the quantity of N minus one multiplied by S squared. And this is a measure of total variability in Y. So I do want to talk about this, whoops, Sorry. I do want to talk about this value for a second. So I'm going to make a little aside. Um, when our correlation coefficients do not work well, as in when X is not a good predictor of Y, and we're trying to have a Val single value that we can use or a single method of predicting our response, we will use TSS when X is not a good predictor. So when we can't use X to predict Y, TSS is a good method. Or in other words, its sample mean is a good method. So I guess I'm not going to write that down. That was just something I wanted to talk a little bit about. It's kind of a backup because the TSS is solely based on the relationship of the response because it is the each individual response subtracted from the average of the response. In fact, we use this measurement to calculate the coefficient of determination, which I'm going to talk about now. So as we said, it involves two sum of squares. The first we've established is TSS. The second sum of squares is a measure of variation, not accounted for, leftover, residual, or error, all synonyms after we've fitted the equation of our data. I've kind of talked about this concept already of having that difference between what we're predicting is going to occur and what actually occurs. And that's what we're measuring here. So we let mu hat of y given xi be the prediction of response for case i for our fitted equation. So what is mu hat? of y given xi, it is literally our fitted equation. So in this case, since it's our simple linear regression, we really have u hat of y given x, which is equivalent to beta naught hat plus beta one hat multiplied by our predictor x. So this is our 
predicted line and when we plug in for a specific x it is our predicted response and so this introduced to us a concept of residuals and again this is our subtraction of what we have actually happening versus what we predicted was going to occur it's again that space of the point to the line and in order to make this a sum of squares there's two ways we could calculate this we abbreviate it as SSE sum of squares error and it is the summation of our errors squared or in other words the summation of the actual minus predicted values quantity squared now in this course your SSE should always be less than or equal to your TSS in order to show this with our small fake data set let's take a look at it graphically so let our red line be that linear fit so it's our mu hat of y given x each of our dots are our small fake data set we know our mean fit and our linear fit so this red is for our SSE it is the distance between our actual values to our predicted values we square it to get the area and then we add it up so you know one box two three four and five just another way of thinking of how to get your SSE it's the area of those five boxes it's the area of our residuals and we can see the TSS in green we know that the average of our Y responses is two and once again we're going to make a box between the actual values to our average of our y values add up the areas to get our total sum of squares now as I established earlier the SSE is less than or equal to our TSS this gives us a third measurement which is known as SSR also known as the sum of squares regression we can use this sum of squares regression and our total sum of squares to calculate that coefficient of determination or capital R squared so capital R squared is equal to SSR over TSS I'm going to be perfectly honest I do not prefer to use this formula for the coefficient of term determination the reason for that is SSR is based on TSS and SSE so in order to calculate your SSR you need to have SSE so I prefer the alternative formula and it's the one you'll see me use and that is 1 minus SSE over TSS I'm the only reason I even really give you SSR over TSS is because it's what your textbook uses and these are equivalent but again you're going to see me in my lecture videos use the second formula of 1 minus SSE over TSS now going a bit into it what exactly is R squared it is the fraction of overall slash raw variability in Y in some sense accounted for in the affinity equation R squared must always be between be between the values of 0 and 1 the closer it is to 1 the better of a linear fit closer to 0 less of a fit so for example in our real estate example the fit of y by x and jump prints out r squared as 0.8796 
In order to interpret this correctly, we say that 88% of the raw variability in price can be accounted for or explained using home size as a predictor or explanatory variable. So basically we use this generically we would say that the blank percent of raw variability in our response can be accounted for or explained using X as a predictor or explanatory variable. This is the interpretation you should use whenever I ask you to explain the coefficient of determination or R squared. And in fact, if you flip back to slide, I believe it is 89, if you recall, I said this was the jump output. In fact, why not? Let's just scroll back for a second. So slide 89, I said when we use jump, you're gonna get a bunch of output. You understand that the least squares line is, the uh, number of observations, the mean of response, and we've now just talked about R squared. Coefficient of determination, it measures the overall raw variability that can be explained. We will talk about adjusted R squared in a different lecture video, as well as root mean squared error. But to wrap us up, let's go ahead and actually com compute R squared by hand. So as I scroll back to where we were before, calculating R squared using our small fake data set. So we learned from our previous by hand calculations that our mu hat of y given x for our small fake data set is 2 minus 1.2x, and that our errors are going to be our actual responses minus our predicted responses, and then we'll square it in the final column. So to begin, plugging in our response values, so this would be 2 minus 1.2 multiplied by negative 2. This will equal 4.4. This would be 3.2, 2, 0 0.8, and negative 0.4. Now it's going to be a simple subtraction of our response minus our predictions. This will be negative 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 1, 0.2, and negative 0.6. This last column, a simple square of the previous column, so this will be 0 0.16, 0 0.04, 1, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.04, and 0.36. If we recall, our SSE is the summation of our errors squared. So if we add up this last column, we will get our SSE. So this would be 1.6. So in order to calculate our R squared or correlation of coefficient, if I use our previous knowledge, our formula is 1 minus SSE over TSS. We just calculated SSC to be 1.6. and We know our TSS to be 16. We calculated that on slide 90. So this will give us a correlation coefficient of 0.9. Very good. So this would indicate that this data set has a pretty strong linear association. Now at this point, I do want to briefly talk about the relationship that exists between the correlation coefficient and our coefficient of determination. So in this very special case of simple linear regression where we have a single predictor X, capital R squared, also known as the, as the coefficient of determination is actually equivalent to lowercase r squared, our coefficient of correlation. So for example, in our real estate data, capital R squared per the jump output was 0.8796. 
if you were to take the square root of that value, then you would have gotten your correlation coefficient, or simply r. Again, this is something that only happens in the simple linear regression situation, where r is equal to the plus or minus the square root of capital R squared. What sign do you use? It is the sign that is related to your slope. Now, if we think back to our slide 84, I said that there were two descriptive questions that we cared about in our simple linear regression knowledge. The first was what was the best line to use in describing how y varies with x? The answer to that was that there was the least squares line. To answer our second question, How may one quantify the strength of any apparent linear relationship between an X and Y? You can use R and R squared to answer that question. Now, there is a couple caveats I do want to talk about using R and capital R squared. Just some things you need to be aware of so that you don't make any unnecessary errors. So the first caveat I want to say is that the least squares are line r and r squared are highly sensitive to a few extreme data points which i will explain more on the next slide our next caveat is that r and r squared only measure linear association three we need to and must be aware of extrapolation and four and this is a big one Correlation is not necessarily causation. So to go into these caveats a little bit further, if we take a look at this scatter plot of ages and heights of a classroom full of Purdue students, notice that we have one student who is both older and taller than the rest of the students. With this student in the data, the correlation coefficient is 0.33. If this student is not included in the data set, the correlation is only 0.3. And even if you were to take your hand and cover that up, that extraneous point up, you could see that would make sense. There wouldn't be a whole lot telling you a direction to, in order to create a line of best fit. But once you include that one outlier, you now have a direction, which is why we say the least squares line, R squared and R are very sensitive to a few extreme points be aware of this if you have an extreme point it can really throw your information off second the second caveat said remember this only measures linear association so if we have a data set like pictured here if we were to take a second and graph it you would see that this wonderful data set makes a parabola well this is a issue because as I've said before, R and R square only measure a linear association. So while there is a clear association in this case, R squared and R are not going to be useful because this is not a linear relationship. So this would give us a pretty poor R value. Third caveat, which told us to be wary of extrapolation. So extrapolation is the idea of using data beyond what your knowledge base is. So for example, in this graph, we have muscle mass for age. And it shows from people ages 40 to 80 that as they got older, their muscle mass decreases. Well, chances are the older you get in the sense of if we were looking at ages 90 and 100, their muscle mass of that individual would still decrease. However, we would go into the opposite direction, say looking at people 30 and 20, that might be true. But if you go back further to say an infant, I don't know about you, but my muscle mass has definitely improved from the time I was an infant. So trying to predict information beyond the bounds of what you've sampled is dangerous. Kind of like the stock market, where just some because the stock market may be going up, that doesn't mean the next day there's not going to be a crash. So this is why we say, be wary of extrapolation. It could be very, very wrong. 
And our final, our final caveat is correlation is not necessarily causation. Take a sports example. If you were to look at a basketball player by the number of points they score and the number of fouls you could commit, you would probably see something that is positively correlated. However, you would not advise a basketball player to foul more in order to get more points. That's not how it works. People who play more are gonna get fouled more. People who play more are gonna score more. Same thing with like skiing accidents in the winter. If you were to measure temperature in correlation to the number of skiing accidents, it would appear that skiing accidents are caused by cold weather, but that's not true. It's just that you only ski in cold weather. So again, just be wary of correlation and causation. And that brings us to the end of chapter seven, part one notes. As always, if you have questions, please send me an email. Have a good night.